you are listening to The Evidence Locker. As you may or may not know, The Evidence Locker is a podcast proudly produced in Australia. And as such, it would be much appreciated if you could vote for us in the Australian Podcast Awards. Please find the link in today's show notes, and thank you. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Today's show is the second episode of a two-part case. We recommend you listen to our episode, The Backpacker Murders, Part 1, before listening to Part 2. Bruce Pryor, a potter who lived in Bundanoon, near Belangelo State Forest, took an interest in the case of the Backpacker Murders in 1992. He had a feeling that there could be more bodies in the forest. It's a vast and rugged terrain, and not many people go there. Bruce went into the forest occasionally to collect firewood, so he knew it rather well. After Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark were found in September 1992, he made a point of going to the forest every week, looking, searching. Perhaps, even if he saw a hunter or someone else that was there often, who he could identify, it would be a clue, or evidence, anything. It became his personal obsession. Then, in October 1993, he found a human skull. The reality of what he was dealing with hit home with Bruce, knowing that he was walking in the killer's footsteps. It was a creepy feeling, so he left as quickly as he could and notified authorities. What Bruce didn't know was that at the scene were the remains of two people. The bodies were identified by dental records. Bruce had found the young missing couple from Victoria, James Gibson and Deborah Everest, who had disappeared four years before. James had been stabbed eight times. A large knife cut through his upper spine, which would have paralyzed him. Deborah's skull had several fractures. She was viciously beaten, her jaw was broken, and she had knife wounds to her head. Her tights were used to tie her up. Their remains were found just about 600 yards from the scene where Carolyn and Joanne were found in an area called Miner's Despair. There was the same makeshift fire pit near their remains with multiple cigarette butts. A tree stump at the scene was riddled with bullet holes. Police officers from across New South Wales arrived at Belangelo to conduct a search, and journalists weren't far behind. It turned out to be the biggest search ever conducted in Australia. But even with more than 300 officers, they were dwarfed by the enormity of the task. Belangelo stretches over 25 square miles, that's 40 square kilometers. With both crime scenes within 50 yards of a dirt track, Rows of searchers started from the roads and worked their way into the forest. A community meeting was called in Barrel to appease local residents. Over 200 people showed up. Barrel is a grand little town with weekend homes and estates. Crimes like these murders were very uncommon. Police assured residents that they were increasing their presence in the area and that they were working around the clock to achieve results. 200 people showed up. The biggest concern was, because the forest was not much of a tourist attraction, was the murderer a local? Could the monster be one of their own? A task force was created to give their undivided attention to the case. It was called Task Force Air. It eventually grew to 33 detectives and 11 analysts, supported by ballistics and crime scene investigators. A good starting point was to look at the man who found the bodies, Bruce Pryor. It is not uncommon for a killer to inject himself into an investigation, and police were suspicious of his explanation. Was he only an amateur sleuth, or did he know more? Bruce was caught off guard. 
He thought he was helping and could not believe that he had become a suspect. It didn't take investigators long to exclude him as a person of interest, and they were back to square one. During an organized police search of Bolangolo on November 1, 1993, officers lined up, side by side, off a dirt track running through the forest. As they were about to start their search, the officer at the very end of the line noticed a boot in the shrubs. The body of a woman was covered with branches and leaves, so asked to conceal her. Dental records confirmed that it was 22-year-old German backpacker, Simone Schmidl. Simone had eight stab wounds to the chest and to the back, two of which had severed her spine. A piece of string, tied like a noose, was found near her body. It looked like it was used as a restraint. Twenty-two caliber shell casings were found at the scene. Also at the scene was another signature makeshift fireplace. The scene was deep into the forest, about a 30-minute drive. Simone must have known that she was in serious danger before she was murdered. Eventually, Simone's camping equipment and round black-rimmed eyeglasses turned up in the bush near Wangaratta, a small town of Victoria, about four hours' drive south from Blangla. Sadly, before New South Wales police could inform Simone's mother, Erwenia Schmidl, she heard that her daughter's body was discovered on the news. Two days later, another grisly discovery was made. The bodies of Gabor Nugabauer and Anya Hapsheed. Their bodies were found in close proximity to Simone Schmidl's resting place. 20-year-old Anya was decapitated. Gabor was shot six times in the head. Like Carolyn Clark, Gabor was used for target practice. The zipper on his jeans was undone, with a button fastened. It wasn't clear if Anya watched Gabor die or if he witnessed her decapitation before he was murdered. To this day, Anya's head has never been found. Anya's rings and bracelet were still on her body. Traveler's checks, student cards, and airline tickets with Anya and Gabor's name were found at the scene, inside of a plastic bag. This made investigators conclude that robbery was not the motive. Bullets and cartridges were found and compared to ballistic evidence found at the other scenes. Altogether, close to 200 bullet casings were found. All bullets were fired by the same weapon with the same distinctive defect. There was a definitive link between all the murders. The same person was most likely responsible for all seven. The Habsheed and Nugabauer families were notified by New South Wales police by phone as they were in Germany at the time. The truth about what happened to their bright and adventurous children must have been far worse than anything they could have imagined. By mid-November, the two-week search of the Belangelo State Forest was called off. 300 police had grown to 400 in the course of the search, and at the end of the last day, all 400 police paused for a minute's silence in respect to the victims of the backpacker murderer. Police felt they had to act soon, as backpackers and tourists didn't want to travel to New South Wales anymore. The murders had a negative impact on tourism to the state, and it also tainted Australia's image as a carefree, safe place to visit. There was tremendous pressure on police to catch whoever had committed these heinous crimes. Their best evidence at that moment in time was still the spent bullet casings. A call to hand in all Ruger 1022 semi-automatic rifles in New South Wales was made, and each one that was brought in was tested by the Ballistic Center in Sydney. Again, this was a very time-consuming exercise. All time and resources could not be focused on ballistics alone. Police had to look at the victims' profiles. What did they have in common? Firstly, they were all backpackers, and no one was local to the area where their bodies were found. They were all hitchhiking, and many had stayed in hostels in Sydney before using public transport to Liverpool Station. All the bodies had been stabbed multiple times. Some bodies were shot. The victims were shot at the scene in the forest where they were found. The locations were scenes of torture and murder. They were not simply dumping spots. Due to the brutal physical nature of the attacks, and considering the profile drawn up the previous year by forensic psychologist Dr. Milton, police concluded that the killer was male. He left some of the victim's personal effects to serve as clues. But he was not consistent in what he left behind and what he took with him as trophies. The traveler's backpacks were mostly missing, 
and police hoped that this would be the evidence to tie a person to the crimes when they eventually surfaced. The typical victim was a backpacker, without anything of great monetary value on his or her person. Joanne Walters and Carolyn Clark were made to undress and then dress again. Carolyn was shot repeatedly and Joanne stabbed multiple times. It was suggested that victims, both males and females, had been sexually assaulted. But due to the advanced stage of decomposition, it could not be proved. Whoever was behind the murders seemed to be killing for sport, nothing else. All the bodies were covered with branches and leaves and left in a disturbingly symmetrical manner. The scenes were always located just off dirt roads that run through the forest. What concerned investigators was the fact that there was an increase in the nature of the ritualistic aspect of the murders. Each body was found lying in a north-south direction, with heads to the south. The murders seemed to be taking longer. The killer was enjoying himself more and more. The post-mortem examinations showed that the killings were extremely violent. The victims had no defensive wounds, which shows that they had no chance to escape or fend off their brutal and controlling attacker. Besides the physical violence, the story of psychological torture emerged from evidence at the crime scenes. Shattered beer bottles indicated that he had lined the bottles up on a tree stump and used them as targets, possibly showing off his marksmanship to his petrified victims before he turned it on them. He would sever the spine of the victim who posed the biggest threat, like Gabor Nugabauer, for instance. Gabor was left paralyzed and could not do anything to defend himself or Anya Habshid as the killer went about his work. A second forensic psychologist, Tim Watson Monroe, said, I believe this person is bad rather than mad. He's not suffering from insanity. It may well be that, as with other serial killers, he is able to mask his badness between episodes of killing. It may be that the person goes to work every day, is in a relationship with someone, and has children. There was a madman on the loose, living amongst the general population. It was a ticking time bomb. Police needed all the help they could get. An appeal went out to the public for any information that could lead to the capture of this monster. A $500,000 reward was offered. At the time, it was the largest reward ever offered in Australia. Police had to admit at a press conference that they were indeed dealing with a serial killer. The story spread like wildfire, and the press dubbed the killer the backpacker murderer. Because the victims were from three different countries, the story made international news. Police were hopeful that there were people who had managed to get away from the killer and publicized the story widely, hoping that someone could come forward. Within the first 24 hours of the hotline, 5,000 tips were called in. Eventually, more than 1 million people called the hotline. One caller was a woman who had an unsettling story of an incident that took place in 1977. She was hitchhiking with a female friend from Liverpool to Canberra. A man in his early 30s had given her a ride, and shortly after Mittagong, he turned onto a dirt road, explaining to them that it was a shortcut. He pulled over and said that he needed to urinate. He walked around the car and flung open her door, trying to pull her out. He said, Okay, girls, who's first? The woman punched him, and both women managed to run away, into the bush where they hid, scared to death as they could hear him searching for them. Fortunately, the man gave up and drove off. The two women found a farmhouse where the homeowners helped them and gave them a ride back to the highway where they continued on to Canberra. They never reported the incident. Another woman called to say she was flagged down by a young man who was running away from a pickup truck parked on the side of the road. She stopped when he screamed, Help! He has a gun! The woman was Joanne Berry, and she remembered the young man was from England and his name was Paul Onions. Two days later, Paul Onions himself called the hotline. Paul was back in England and read about the case in a newspaper. He realized that the bodies were found close to where he had his encounter with the man who gave him a ride four years before. He called the hotline to give police a description of the man. Tragically, his statement got lost in the volume of tips being called in, and nobody followed up with Paul. Police buckled under the pressure of the mammoth investigation. Their systems weren't designed for a search of this magnitude. 
It was the early 90s and the world was in a phase of transition from paper filing systems to computer databases. It was a nightmare to cross-reference reports in the New South Wales Police Administrative System. A more sophisticated computerized system had to be set up, ready for use as soon as possible. A team of computer technicians was created, and they set up a functional database in record time. But it was still a time-consuming system, as reports and statements were often taken down by hand and had to be manually entered onto the database and rechecked to ensure it was correct and could be easily referenced when needed. A program called NetMap was also implemented, which showed satellite images of areas with new growth in the Belangelo State Forest, where possible additional burial sites were located. It showed change of color in satellite imagery on the days of the abductions, proving that the victims were murdered on the same day they disappeared. Police asked an American anthropologist, Dr. Richard Basham, to look at the crime scene at Belangelo. Like Dr. Milton in 1992, Basham also felt that there were two people committing the murders. One was more dominant, and the other more subservient. He also remembered his home in Georgia, where it was common for people to go into the woods and shoot at targets, anything they could find, watermelons, dead animals. The people who typically did this were very close, lifelong friends or even brothers. The solidarity between the band of brothers would typically override rules and laws of society. Dr. Basham suggested that the Belangelo killer was from a large family who saw themselves as a unit, existing separate to the rest of society. Dr. Milton, the forensic psychiatrist, agreed and also felt the family was isolated from the community and owned many firearms. Police remembered the man called Alex Malad and his strange eyewitness statement. When they looked into his background before, they learned that he was from a large gun-loving family. The Malat family was the exact kind of family described by the profilers. The problem was, there were so many Malat brothers. How could they narrow it down? First, they looked at who lived in the Southern Highlands or Southwest Sydney. Who would have had the best opportunity to kidnap the hitchhikers? Police found a property on Wambian Caves Road that was owned by three Malat brothers. It is located roughly halfway between Liverpool and Belangelo State Forest. At this point of the investigation, fortunately, Paul Onion's statement was found amongst the thousands of tips and police followed up with him. His statement fitted exactly what they thought had happened to all the victims. They realized that Paul would be a crucial witness. New South Wales police arranged with British police to interview Paul at his home in England. Paul had a lot of detail in his description of the man who picked him up. Of all the Malat brothers, Paul's description fit Ivan the best. Ivan was also the only one who had owned a vehicle that fitted Paul's description, a Nissan Patrol pickup. But Ivan did not own his Nissan anymore. In fact, he had sold it shortly after Joanne Walters and Caroline Clark's bodies were discovered. Police managed to track down his car. The man who had bought it off him told police that he had found a bullet under the front seat. It was a 22 Winchester bullet, similar to those found at the crime scenes. Police looked at the dates of the abductions and checked the movements of all the Malat brothers on the days in question. Ivan was the only one who was not accounted for on the days of all the abductions. Ivan and Richard Malat both worked at Borel at the time of the murders. Richard was always known to be wild and unpredictable where Ivan was reliable. Work records showed that on each day the victims were abducted. Richard was clocked in at work. Ivan was not. Interestingly, it also showed that around the time James Gibson's backpack was found at Galston Gorge, Ivan was working close by. The net was closing in on Ivan Malat. In 1993, he lived in Eaglevale, in the Liverpool area, southwest of Sydney. Neighbors knew him to be polite and friendly. He was often seen outside washing his car. He took a great deal of pride in it. He had worked for the Department of Main Roads as a road surface sprayer for 16 years. After that, he found a job at Bowrell. He had a criminal record, but all his offenses seemed to be nonviolent. On the surface, he didn't look like he could be the guy that they were looking for. Of all the Malat brothers, he was probably the least likely suspect. But all the evidence said otherwise. The researchers discovered a 23-year-old document about the sexual assault case against Ivan in 1971. 
He followed the same pattern of behavior back then. He had offered the two women in the barrel area a ride, drove them into the forest, and proceeded to sexually assault them. The other woman was in the back seat and tried her best to fend him off, but he was too strong. He shouted at her, ordering her to look the other way. He didn't want her to see him having sex. This became significant in the backpacker murders case, as the victims in the crime scenes were separated, which strongly suggests that someone was in fact sexually assaulted. This was the case where Ivan was not convicted, as his defense convinced the court that it was a case of consensual sex. But with the power of hindsight, that case looked a whole lot different too. Paul Onions was flown to Australia where he was presented with a photo lineup. He positively identified Ivan Malat as the man who had given him a ride all those years before. The man who had introduced himself as Bill. Paul had no doubt whatsoever that he was the right man. Detectives decided it was time to pay Alex Malat a visit, as he was the first person to cast a spotlight onto the Malat family. They went to Alex Malat and his wife Joan's home in Mumbai, Queensland and interviewed them both. Alex and Joan were shocked when they were told that Ivan was most likely the backpacker murderer and cooperated as much as they could. When investigators were about to leave, Joan remembered about a backpack that Ivan had given to them. Ivan had said that it belonged to a friend of his who returned to New Zealand and didn't need it anymore. The backpack belonged to Ivan's third known victim, German-born Simone Schmidl. Police don't know why Joan handed over the backpack and why they waited so long to give it to police if they thought it was suspicious. Police concluded that both Alex and Joan realized Ivan was guilty during that interview, and there was no use covering for him anymore. Police checked Alex's home phone records and found it interesting that Alex did not call Ivan to tip him off and warn him about the investigators being hot on his trail. On Sunday the 22nd of May, 1994, at 6.30 a.m., Armed police descended onto Ivan Malat's home at 22 Cinnabar Street, Eaglevale. Knowing that he had a lot of weapons in the house and that he could be armed, police decided to call him on his home telephone to wake him up and order him to come out of the house. He was asleep in bed with his girlfriend, Shalinder Hughes. He hung up the phone and went back to sleep. Police called a second time and threatened to force their way inside if needed. This time, Ivan and Shalinder came outside. When asked why he didn't respond the first time, Ivan said that he thought it was a prank. Police served a warrant for his arrest and entered the home to commence their search for any evidence that would link Ivan Malat to the backpacker murders. They found their first evidence by just walking into the home. Malat's home was referred to as an Aladdin's cave of evidence by Clive Small, lead investigator into the murders. There was a map of the Belangelo State Forest and a photo of Shalinder Hughes wearing Carolyn Clark's striped Benetton sweatshirt. Later, Shirley Malat said that it was hers. But that particular design was only ever sold in England, somewhere Shirley had never been. In their search of Ivan's house, police found firearms, ammunition, a large hunting knife, and a sword. Simone Schmidl's tent, Deborah Everest's sleeping bag, and more camping equipment were all found in the garage. In the ceiling of the garage, there was a sort of attic, a roof cavity used for storage. One of the forensic technicians climbed into the area to have a closer look. At first, it looked like there was nothing of significance. But once the insulation was removed, he could see a plastic bag tucked into a hole in the wall. Inside the bag was a complete breech bolt assembly, a complete trigger assembly, and an aftermarket magazine for a Ruger 10-22. The breech bolt held the key. It was literally the smoking gun, and it was a definitive match, the individual marks made on cartridges found at the crime scenes. After his arrest, Ivan Malat denied having anything to do with the backpacker murders, despite all evidence found at his home tying him to the victims. On the same day, at the same time, police raided six other properties belonging to the Malat family. Multiple weapons and ammunition were seized enough to fill two rooms with evidence at the police station. Ivan's brothers, Walter and Richard, were also taken into custody that day on firearms charges in suspicion of being Ivan's accomplices. Prosecution, or the Crown as it is called in Australia, took three months to prepare the case against Ivan Malat. He was in remand, 
without the possibility of bail. Walter and Richard were released after they were fined for their firearm offenses. Shirley and William were the only two mulatts who attended Ivan's hearings. At his first hearing, when charges were laid against him, he sat emotionless as he pleaded innocent. Ivan fired John Marsden, his lawyer of many years, in court and said that he preferred to defend himself. He accused police of framing him, planting evidence at his home, which meant that they had no way of linking him to the victims. He later claimed that it was now his family who planted the evidence to frame him. After some confusion as to his legal representation, Ivan settled on Terry Martin and Brisbane lawyer Andrew Bowe. On news footage, as a handcuffed Ivan Malat was taken from an armored vehicle into court, he notoriously smiled and looked upbeat. Lead investigator Clive Small said he believed that he was still in control at that point. He thought he would be released at any minute. He honestly thought he would get away with it all. Mark Tedeschi, QC, argued for the state, keeping it simple and to the point. The backpackers were killed in ferocious and sustained attacks during which vastly more force was used than necessary to kill them. These killings were for killing's sake. In the course of the trial, jurors were transported to Belangelo State Forest. The whole forest was closed off for an entire day to protect the anonymity of the jury members. They were taken to each murder scene and could see where the bodies of all of the seven backpackers were found. No doubt that was an eerie and emotional experience as the deafening silence of the vast forest engulfed them. Back in court, Ivan's ex-wife, Karen, was brought in to testify against him. She had not seen him in the seven years since she'd left him. It was Karen who confirmed that Ivan sometimes used the name Bill. In fact, some people called him Bargo Bill, Bargo being another town in the Southern Highlands area. She said that they often went to the Belangelo State Forest while they were married and that Ivan knew his way around. He never needed a map. This statement contradicted Ivan's testimony that he had never been to the forest. She also said, Ivan just loved guns. Ivan knew how to handle them and was confident about handling guns. Karen had the difficult task of testifying about their troubled marriage and painted the picture of Ivan being a violent and controlling man. After the trial, she was placed in witness protection. A clean-cut Ivan, dressed in a navy blue suit, took the witness stand in his own defense. He denied having had anything to do with the backpacker murders or ever giving Paul Onions a ride. He also had no explanation as to how property of the victims happened to be in his possession and insisted that someone had planted it there in order to frame him. Mark Tedeschi QC pointed out how ridiculous Ivan's claim was. So you ask the jury to accept that someone broke into your locked house, despite the burglar alarm, planted a Ruger rifle bolt in the ceiling of your garage, dropped the weapons receiver in one of your boots in the hall cupboard, making sure both gun parts were painted in the same camouflage color as you use on your firearms, then left a single fired cartridge linked to the murder of Ms. Carolyn Clark in a plastic bag on the bed in a spare room. Ivan, who was usually confident and arrogant, was deflated and had no answer. His defense team could never quite bounce back from there. In his final address, Mark Tedeschi QC said, it is my submission there was only one person in the whole of Australia who matches all of those descriptions, the man, the car, the equipment, and the place, and that is the accused. It's almost as though the accused left a fingerprint in the forest because of the incredible coincidence of all the items being linked to him. The jury deliberated for four days. On the 27th of July, 1996, Ivan Malat was convicted of all seven backpacker murders and sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences with an additional 18 years. It is safe to say he will never get out of prison. Manfred Neugebauer, Gabor's father, said that Gabor was a big and strong young man who stood over six feet tall. That's about 1.86 centimeters. He remembered Gabor fetching firewood in the forest in Germany. He would cut large logs and carry whole stumps. Manfred was convinced that it would have taken more than one man to kill Gabor. During the trial, Ivan's defense blamed Wally and Richard Malott for the murders, but they were never charged. By turning the blame to his brothers, Ivan broke the Malott code. But they understood why it needed to be done, 
even if it was only to plant a seed of doubt in the minds of the jury members. But it didn't work. Wildcard Richard Mallott did speak about the murders at work. He said there were more bodies out there that they hadn't found the two Germans yet. That was before Gabor and Anya were discovered. But Richard claimed he was only speculating after reading the newspaper. A tent and sleeping bags belonging to Joanne and Carolyn were found at Richard's home. He claimed he found them at his mother's house and took it. Police didn't buy it, but they did feel that Richard was too disorganized and too much unlike Ivan to have been involved in such a dark and private pastime with his older brother. But it would also be unlikely for Ivan to have involved anyone outside of the family. So if one or more of his brothers did assist him, which one was it? What police forgot to take into consideration was Ivan's close relationship to one of his sisters. Throughout his life, there were only two women who could not do any wrong in Ivan's eyes. They were his mother Margaret and one of his sisters, Shirley. He shared his house at Eagle Vale with Shirley, and there was talk that their relationship was incestuous. Some members of the Malak clan said that it was definitely the case. Others said they didn't believe it was possible. Shirley could never confirm or deny the story, as it only came out after her death. She suffered a long illness and passed away in 2003. A theory emerged, naming her as Ivan's accomplice in the murders. If she were present when Ivan picked up the hitchhikers, the presence of a woman perhaps made it appear to be safe. They would simply look like a friendly couple heading down south, offering a ride to backpackers. Ivan's own defense lawyer admitted shortly before his own death that he did not think Ivan acted alone. He was adamant that it would not have been one of Ivan's brothers, but he highlighted the fact that of all the Malats, Shirley was the closest to Ivan and the most likely accomplice, if he did in fact have one. All the witnesses who managed to escape, Paul Onions and Ivan's sexual assault victims, all said that Ivan Malat was alone when he picked them up. He never stopped to let anyone else into the vehicle either. Perhaps, the fact that victims were shot and stabbed does not indicate that there were two attackers. Perhaps that was Ivan indulging in the act of torture. He stabbed his victims to kill them, then shot at them using them as targets. Remember, although most of his victims were traveling in pairs, he severed the spines of three. James Gibson, Gabor Nugabauer, and Joanne Walters paralyzing them so they posed no threat to him any longer. And after witnessing all of that, the other victims were probably too scared to fight him. Lead investigator Clive Small concluded that Ivan was a loner and a control freak who would never have trusted anyone to help him kill. Although murderers would typically have a specific method of preference, either stabbing or shooting for instance, Ivan Malat used both. He enjoyed the violence of the stabbings. The shooting was purely for sport, to practice his marksmanship. Police also wondered why Ivan stopped his murder spree after the murders of Gabor Nugabauer and Anya Habshid. More than a year had passed after the first bodies of his victims were discovered. Perhaps he was laying low. Perhaps his relationship with Shalinder Hughes was the reason. When he was married to Karen, he also did not commit any known murders. As long as he was in a controlling relationship and had a submissive woman in his life, he did not have the need to go out and kill. All of the murders were committed when he was not in a stable relationship, where he felt that he was in control. Another question that plagued investigators was, when did Ivan Malat begin killing people? How many murders were unsolved and forgotten, perhaps before he was involved with Marilyn and later Karen in the 1970s and early 1980s? What was his actual body count? One of the many lawyers hired and then fired by Ivan claimed that he believed Ivan had killed more than 100 people over two decades. Police also believe he committed more murders than the seven that he was convicted for. Lead investigator Clive Small estimates the number to be an additional four or five, not quite as many as a hundred. But Ivan never admitted to the murders he was convicted of, so chances are no one would ever know the exact scale of his terror for sure. In January 1988, bushwalkers found a badly decomposed body in Janolan State Forest near the Blue Mountains about 100 miles or 160 kilometers west of Sydney. The victim was 18-year-old Peter Letcher. He was last seen alive three months before when he had hitched a ride from his girlfriend's home in Sydney's southwest. 
He had just asked his girlfriend to marry him, but she said no, as she was only 15 years old and felt she was too young. Rejected and aimless, Peter left Sydney. There were many similarities in Peter's murder to the backpacker murders, and police feared that the Janolan State Forest could be a second murder and burial site. On the 8th of August, 1996, a team of investigators began searching the area of the Blue Mountains. No evidence of any further killings was found. In 2001, Ivan Malat testified at an inquest into the disappearances of three young women, 20-year-old Leanne Goodall, 14-year-old Amanda Robinson, and 15-year-old Robin Hickey all vanished from the Newcastle area within four months of each other from the summer of 1978 to 1979. Strike Force Fenwick was set up in 1998 after Ivan's conviction to reopen the cases of the missing Newcastle girls. They found that Ivan was working on the roads and staying at the local Star Hotel at the time of the disappearances. There was not enough evidence to charge him, and that was the end of that. But Malat is still the prime suspect in the murders here. Two years later, there was another inquest into the disappearance of hitchhiker Annette Briffa, but again, the evidence was insufficient to press charges. In 2006, Ivan was named a suspect in the disappearance of two Sydney nurses in 1980. Jillian Jameson and Deborah Balkin, both 20, were last seen at the Parramatta Hotel, but again, the case lacks evidence. If you've listened to the podcast Teacher's Pet, you'd know that Chris Dawson was recently arrested for the murder of his wife, Lynn, in 1980. Chris's defense team are trying to sell the theory that Lynn was also one of Ivan Malat's victims, but that does not look very likely either. In May 2015, Boris Malat came forward and claimed that Ivan had shot a taxi driver called Neville Knight in the 1960s. An expert was brought in to conduct a polygraph on Boris and Alan Dillon, who was convicted of the shooting which paralyzed the taxi driver. Both polygraphs indicated that the men were telling the truth. Ivan Malat was the one who shot Neville Knight. Ivan was never charged for the shooting, but there was some comfort in the fact that he is in prison and he will never get out. He has appealed his conviction, but he was not granted a new trial. In protest, he cut off his little finger with a plastic serrated knife let the blood drain out in the urinal of his prison cell, and then placed it in an envelope addressed to the High Court of Australia. Back in 1996, on Ivan's first day in Maitland Jail, while he was lining up, waiting to be assigned a cell, he was beaten up by another inmate. A year later, in May 1997, Ivan made an escape attempt with another inmate, George Savis, a former Sydney counselor and convicted drug dealer. The plan was foiled and Savas hung himself in his cell the same night. The very next day, Ivan was moved to the maximum security superprison in Goulburn, less than an hour's drive from the Belangelo State Forest. Ivan's brother George said Ivan confessed the murders to his mother before she died. None of the other members of the Malat family ever wanted to comment on this. Ivan's case has ripped the family apart, a family that once had a bond so strong Nobody would ever have thought it possible. The majority of Ivan's siblings think he is innocent, while George, Boris, and Richard believe him to be guilty. Boris even went so far as to accuse Ivan of more murders. He said in an interview on Australian Story, Wherever Ivan has worked, people have disappeared. Seeing as Ivan worked on roads all over New South Wales for 16 years, that is a very unsettling thought. Boris has changed his name and won't tell his family where he lives. They see him as a traitor because he would speak openly about the family to police and in television interviews. And in a somber twist of fate, Ivan's nephew, Matthew Malott, decided to follow in his infamous uncle's footsteps. In 2010, Matthew and two friends, Cohen Klein and Chase Day, took their childhood friend, David Ochterlony, to the Belangelo State Forest on his 17th birthday. David thought they were going to drink beer and smoke weed, but Matthew Malott had other plans. As soon as they had reached an isolated spot, he started an argument with David, accusing him of talking about him behind his back. Chase Day knew what was about to happen and tried to stop Matthew, who ordered him to go back to the car. Cohen Klein, on the other hand, took out his mobile phone and recorded the whole gruesome event. Matthew Malott produced a double-bladed axe and hacked at David. 
all the while tormenting him with insults. Cohen kept rolling the recording until David expired. Matthew and Cohen were arrested two days later. They were tried and convicted. Matthew Malott received 42 years in prison with 30 years no parole. Cohen Klein received 32 years for his involvement. Matthew showed absolutely no remorse and went so far as to say, You know me. You know my family. You know the last name Malott. I did what we do. If you'd like to hear more about the David Ochterlony murder, our podcasting friend Felon covers the case in detail in Episode 6, The Belangelo Forest Axe Murder. If this case interested you, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. Also join our Facebook group and chat with other listeners about other cases that we have covered. And if you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate it if you could review the episodes as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. While you're waiting for our next episode, why not listen to one of our podcasting friends? This is Broderick Ashmole, host of Felon True Crime, a podcast that takes a look at some of the more obscure cases from Australia. Felon has been described by various listeners as the following. Creepy and atmospheric. Intriguing, sad and real. A spine-tingling take on true crime. It's more than just storytelling. It's factual and emotional. It's an experience. It's respectful, but doesn't shy away from the gory details. If these comments have caught your attention, and it sounds like a podcast you'd like to experience for yourself, you can subscribe to Felon on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Felon True Crime. The underbelly of the land down under. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.